I want to welcome those who are joining us online, our great friends from California. It's 5 o'clock there. They're in the Sheriff's Department, Police Department, and they watch faithfully every week. As well as people from around Enid who can't come because of various responsibilities, but they watch some live, some archive, as well as those of you uh, who are friends of the Story of Ministries. Great group of ladies here today. We have a few who are out of town, um, and they'll be watching as well. We have an extraordinary chapter that we're going to study today, Isaiah chapter 21. I know some of you may not have read the chapter yet, but if you did take the opportunity to read ahead, I can almost guarantee you, you had no idea what you were reading. And, and, and I see some heads saying, yeah, you're right. I had no idea. Okay, well, by the time we're done, I think it will be crystal clear to you. There'll still be some questions that you'll have, and we'll try to take those. Uh, but in the introduction, I'm going to give you the setting. If you read Dr. Darnell's notes, a lot of what he said, I will be repeating, but I'm going to say it, maybe not in as scholarly of a manner. I'm going to bring it down to our level and help you understand why this chapter was written. But before we begin, we'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. Those of you who are watching, thank you for understanding that really this is a Bible study for the room. And Jean Bundy is still on her trip. Jean, if you see this, I'm praying for your safe travels. Jan, it's all yours. Okay, I put, uh, I found the prayer request. Make any alterations on it that you need to, and another sheet to add prayer requests. And uh, Ruth Ann is in charge of the prayer today. Beautiful, Ruth Ann, thank you. Okay. Um, I feel like as we uh, go through Isaiah. I just, I feel like I've, I'm seeing our current day play consistently, and that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> Mighty Father, creator of, heaven, creator of heaven and earth, we humbly thank you for this opportunity to study your word and draw closer to you. The world continually swirls around us, trying to reach its grip into our hearts. We know our greatest weapon to withstand the world is to be secure in your awesome love through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In these days <clears throat> where truth is a rare commodity, let Enid be a reflection of truth. Yahweh, I humbly thank you for all our elected officials. Yes. I pray your leading and influence over each one concerning city affairs. I pray Enid continues to be a welcoming city, a place where one is able to have refuge and a home. I thank you for the friendships that blossom in your presence here. You gave us free will. We choose to seek you with our hearts and draw closer to you now. We give you all the praise and glory and honor. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ruthann. All right. Let's begin. And I'm sorry. I tagged Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl. <laughs> all right. Cheryl is, is next week. So, all right. We are studying the prophet Isaiah and the scroll that he wrote. Just for context, uh, some of you have the most beautiful handwriting I've ever seen uh, because I've got notes from you, and it's stunning. Don't get too esoteric about the book of Isaiah. What I mean by that is this. Don't think of it in any other way than a letter you would write to your family. This is what Isaiah is doing. He's writing a letter to his family, to the Jews, to the people that he loves. He was born in 761 BC. For context, remember King David, King Solomon, King Saul, who was the first king. They only reigned in the United Kingdom of Israel for 120 years, from 1051 to 931. So if Isaiah was born in 761, you're talking 
about a long time after King David and King the United States and today. Does that make sense? Okay. So that kind of gives you some context. Carrie, good to see you. Appreciate you being here. And Carrie's sister is also watching. I want to say hello to her. Um, when Isaiah was born, the kingdom of Israel had already split into two kingdoms because of a civil war that came to the country of Israel. It came in the year 931 B.C. at the death of the last king of Israel in the United Kingdom at the death of Solomon. His son Rehoboam wanted to increase the taxes on the people of Israel and 10 of the families called tribes of Israel hated that and so they split and said we're going to start our own capital they called it Samaria we're going to move into the northern portion of Israel called the northern kingdom we are the true Israel. We're going to call ourselves Israel. By the way, you guys down south, Judah, and the kings were kings of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin as well, Judah and Benjamin. You keep your own capital, Jerusalem. We'll have ours. Isaiah was born in the south. His hometown was Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. He was a, a <coughs> prince. He was the nephew of the king of Judah uh, when he was born. But he was called to be a prophet to God's people, both to the northern kingdom and to the southern kingdom. So his writings would reach both kingdoms of Israel. He is the most well-known <coughs> biblical prophet. And the scroll that he wrote pieced together by editors into one book is divided into three sections. And we've seen this. We're still in the first section. We're going chapter by chapter. The first book of Isaiah is chapters 1 through 39. The second book of Isaiah, called Deutero Isaiah, Deutero is second in Hebrew. Deuteronomy is the second book of the law. Deuteronomy. Uh, the law is revealed and given in the book of Exodus, but then it's repeated in Deuteronomy. So Deutero Isaiah is Isaiah 40 through 55, and Trito, the third Isaiah, is Isaiah 56 through 66. Now you say, well, why, why is that important to understand? Well, very important to comprehend because... In the first 39 chapters, you have words of Yahweh to the people of Yahweh, the Jews, before the Babylonian captivity, before the Jews are taken into captivity in 586 when Jerusalem is destroyed. Chapters 40 through 55 are words of comfort and encouragement to the Jews in Babylonian captivity. And chapters 56 through 66 are words of hope and future for the Jews leaving Babylonian captivity, coming back to rebuild Jerusalem and reestablish their nation. Does that make sense? That's why Isaiah is divided into these three sections. As I said, yeah, go ahead. He says that was a letter he's writing home. Yep. That's a long letter. It's a long letter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. You're right, Doc. And by the way, Doc's right. Let me. I, I, it would be better to say this. It's multiple letters. Multiple letters. Because there are many scrolls that are then pieced together by an editor over time. Does that make sense? So it's multiple letters. By the way, I do this with my books. I write little articles. And then over time, I piece those article, articles together in the form of a book. Michelle and I were talking about that even last night. That is exactly right. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. No, go ahead. Do we know about how long it took Isaiah to write those? That's a great question. Um, no, we don't know how long, but I will say this, and Isaiah 21 is an example. When events arose that required a word from Yahweh for the people, encouragement 
discipline, hope, he would write. Does that make sense? So, the best way I could answer your question is this. Throughout his entire lifetime, he wrote these letters. Does that make sense? But you're reading them in one book. Now, some Hebrew scholars believe that Deutero Isaiah was written by someone else, a disciple, as we've said. Trento Isaiah, written by a third person, a disciple of Isaiah. And by the way, in ancient culture, it was not uncommon for a disciple to write in the name of his mentor. They did it all the time. Okay, you don't do that today. You just don't. They call it <coughs> plagiarism or they, 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 you know. But back then, it was a way to honor your mentor. Okay, so. All right, make sense? Great question. By the way, always in a row. Raise your hand, ask a question. Uh, you are welcome uh, to do that. This is a safe place and there is no dumb question. Well, except the unasked question. Because I'm using the word dumb in its second sense. You're not speaking. It's a dumb question. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy gets it. Here we go. Okay, so we're still in this first section of Isaiah. And we're in chapter 21 today. So we're about to come to the end of these 10 to 11 chapters that are oracles or visions about the surrounding nations. I showed you this last week, and some of you took a photo of it, but chapters 13 through 23 is broken down into these visions that Isaiah sees from Yahweh about the surrounding nations. These are Gentile nations. These are not Jews who live in these nations. The reason it's important for you to grasp that is this. Too often, Christians make the mistake of reading the Old Testament and thinking Yahweh is only speaking to the Jews. No, he's speaking to all the nations because he's the creator of the world. He is God of all the nations. Make sense? All right, very good. So the theme of these oracles in general is this. When you turn, from me, the creator, and from the natural laws that all of creation, my creation, understands, written in your heart and in your mind, I will send four horsemen to humble you. Now he got into the book of Revelation. There we go. <laughs> Getting into the book of Revelation. By the way, I just finished reading Doc's new book on Revelation. I think it's his best work. We're trying to get it published uh, by a professional publisher. Uh, and we're going to go to Revelation after Ezekiel. But Doc understands. He gets it. Revelation is just a picture of God's dealings with the nations. Cyclically. Happens all the time. Over and over again. This is why I believe you make a fundamental mistake. When you ask the question, are we in the days of revelation? Is this the end of the world? Here's the mistake. We may be in the days of revelation, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It just means we're in the cycle of judgment. That happens over and over and over and over again among all the nations. And America may be in it right now, just as we then pray now. Before we read Isaiah 21, this is something that, uh, Carrie, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Not because you guys need it simple. You're some of the smartest women I've ever been around. But I'll just tell you this. Most professors in seminaries won't know what I'm about to tell you. Most students who graduate from seminary won't know what I'm about to tell you. And because of that, Isaiah 21, I feel, is often misunderstood. Dr. Darnell is the first commentator that I've ever read that has written out things that I have believed. And I'm like, wow, good for Dr. Darnell. <laughs> Let me show you some things that I think are important. I'll move to the map here. When Isaiah was born... The world's first kingdom 
have taken control. And remember that the world's first kingdom is called Assyria, the first letter of the alphabet in every language. Hebrew, Aleph. English, A. Greek. Uh, you have uh, from the beginning Alpha and Omega. Assyria is the world's first kingdom. What does a kingdom mean? It's a king's dominion. And a kingdom is a country that extends beyond its borders and conquers neighboring people, overthrows the king of the neighboring country, establishes a puppet king, and takes taxes from those people. They have a standing army that conquers other nations. Assyria is the first. Now, you have other kingdoms, but, but they don't become conquering kingdoms. They're not an empire. Okay. So this is how vast the Assyrian Empire became. But, I'm not throwing you a trick question, I'm just going to ask you. Does anybody know or remember who the world's second empire was? Oh, very good. Very good. It's Babylon, like B. So just remember, for Syria, Babylon was the world's second empire, which means what? Babylon had to conquer Assyria, and they did. But this is what most people don't know. Here's Babylon. It's on the left flank, the left rear of the capital of Assyria. Assyria is paying attention over here. Moving. This is desert, the Arabian desert. So, and they're up here into what we call Turkey. They're expanding west, and they're kind of ignoring the east, mostly because of a mountain range here. And this flank right here causes Assyria problems. And this is the fact that most people don't know. In 710 B.C., 710 B.C., Isaiah is 51 years old. The king of Assyria comes to these rebels in Babylon and wipes them out. He destroys the city of Babylon. He destroys it. Now, later... This king, Sargon of Assyria, his grandson, rebuilds Babylon. And I'm about to show you two pictures. But here's what I want you to see. We're going to read about Babylon in the first 11 verses of Isaiah 21. And most commentators jump way ahead to 539 B.C. when the Babylonian Empire collapses because they're attacked by the Medes and the Elamites. And they jump way ahead and say, Isaiah is seeing into the future and the destruction of Babylon. No, no, no. I don't believe that for a moment. He's writing this because his people know that Assyria is on the march and his people are wanting to depend upon Egypt and wanting to depend upon Babylon because they've heard about Babylon's revolt. And Isaiah is saying, don't do that. Trust Yahweh. So I believe that this chapter we're about to read is written to encourage God's people not to trust in Babylon and to revolt in the Assyrian kingdom. Now, we'll come back to this if you have questions, but here's what I just want you to see. We're about to read a prophecy about the destruction of the Babylonians. Now, here's what happened. In fact, I'll come back to this map. When Babylon was destroyed, this was the fortress city. And again, I'll show you a picture in a couple of moments. The people had nowhere to go. The Babylonians, the Chaldeans, that's, that's their other name. They had nowhere to go. Their city was gone. So you know where they spread? They spread out like this. 
they spread out from Babylon into Elam and Media. And the Medes and the Elamites hated them. And they basically wiped them out. And we're going to read about that in this text. Sargon. Let me tell you why you need to know about Sargon. When Israel, the northern kingdom, was destroyed in 722, and the men taken out, captured, the cities destroyed, the women, the Israeli women remained, and they brought in pagan men and intermarried with them, and their descendants became known as the Samaritans. We've gone over. Sargon was the king that conquered Israel. Now, Sargon, Sargon II was his name. Uh, he established what is known as the Sargonid dynasty of Assyria. And this is why you need to know this. When I was studying the Bible, Nancy, nobody ever taught me this, so I was so confused, so absolutely confused. You'll read about Tiglath Pileser in the Bible. You'll come across his name. This picture right here, honestly, Rochelle, this will really help anybody who wants to know about the Assyrian kings. When he died in 727, he had a son, Shalmaneser IV, and you'll read about him in the Bible, who only reigned for about five years. The only thing we know about him is from biblical literature. And then Sargon is another son of Tiglath, and many people believe that he killed his brother to take the throne. Sargon II establishes what is called the Sargonid dynasty, and it lasts for 90 years until Babylon destroys Assyria at the Battle of Nineveh. And these are the great kings of the Sargonid dynasty. There's seven of them. The last three are the sons of Ashurbanipal, and they're very minor, but here's my point. Sargon you need to know about because he's the guy that destroyed northern Israel. And then he makes threats on Jerusalem. But later on in Isaiah, when Jerusalem is surrounded by the Assyrians and 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are killed in one night, it's Sennacherib who is the king of Assyria at that time in 701 BC. But then when Sennacherib is defeated and goes back home to Nineveh, uh, to his capital, his own sons kill him. And uh, the reason his sons kill him is because his youngest son, Esarhaddon is his name, he wanted Esarhaddon to be king, and his older brothers didn't like that. So they killed their father, and then there was a civil war in Assyria, and Esarhaddon, get this, kills all his brothers, all his brothers' families, takes their property, and he becomes king. This is the guy that rebuilds the city of Babylon. And then you have Asher Banapal, uh, who is the last great king of the Sargonid dynasty of Assyria. And then after he dies, he reigns 42 years after he dies. His three sons battle for the throne. Assyria is in decline, and they finally are wiped out by the Babylonians in 612 B.C. at the Battle of Nineveh, uh, basically a hundred years after the Assyrians destroyed Babylon. And it was rebuilt. Here are the pictures. Here are the pictures. Um, here you have... You have the capital of Babylon, Nineveh. Of course, remember Jonah goes to Nineveh. Okay, here's Babylon, the flank. Babylon's destroyed. The people, after it's destroyed in 710 BC, scattered, then they're wiped out by the Medes and the Persians. Then Esarhaddon rebuilds Babylon, and it becomes a great city of the Assyrian Empire. And then when the Babylonians defeat the Assyrians, they make it their capital. Then when the when the Persians defeat the Babylonians in 539, they make Babylon their capital. When the Greeks defeat the Persians, uh, Alexander the Great makes Babylonia his capital of the East. Babylon becomes the center of the world. But the point that you need to remember is this. Babylon was taken twice. 710 B.C., 539 B.C. When Babylon was taken the second time in 539, you read about it in Daniel chapter 5. When Persia defeats Babylon and becomes the world's third empire. But what most Christians don't know is Babylon's first destruction in 710. This is what the original Babylon 
would have looked like when the Assyrians destroyed them. Okay? This is what <coughs> the rebuilt Babylon would have looked like. And these walls that you're seeing here are in the Berlin Museum, the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Here is a map, as we're going to read in Isaiah 21, about the Elamites and the Medes who destroy the Babylonians that are scattered because the Assyrians have destroyed the capital of Babylon. And then here's a map of the world. Let me show you something. And, and this will really help you. What we're studying in Scripture is the beginning of what is called Western civilization. Here we are, right here. <laughs> here is Babylon. This is West. This is East. Western civilization is when Greece defeats Persians and the West expands under Grecian influence. We, we read about it in Scripture. But here's the thing. The center of the world since Noah is right here. So, what is the theme of this chapter? Trust the Lord. Believe Yahweh. And if you don't, if you're proud, you think you can do it yourself, He'll bring down any nation that trusts in themselves. We're then just like you said. We trust in our army. We trust in our economy. We trust in our laws and not his. He will bring our nation down. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Yes. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. and He will direct your paths. Isaiah 21 is about the Jews wanting to trust Babylon. Wanting to trust Idumea. What, Isaiah 20 was then wanting to trust Egypt and Ethiopia to protect them from Assyria. And Isaiah comes along in a letter that he writes, right to left, in a scroll, to be read, saying, Don't do that. Don't do that. Because these nations in whom you're trusting, they're going down. Trust in me. I'll protect you. And when we come to Isaiah later on in 701 BC, when the Assyrians surround Jerusalem, now Egypt is conquered, they're gone. Babylon's conquered, they're gone. Idumea is conquered. We're going to read here, they're gone. Who do they have? Who do the Jews have to trust? Nobody but Yahweh. So Hezekiah, the king, walks in temple of Yahweh falls on his face and says, Oh God, be merciful. And God rescues them. Okay. That's all introduction, but I'm telling you, you had to hear it in order to understand Isaiah 21. Thoughts, comments? Doc, make sense? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, to me, you have to start studying any book like Isaiah by studying Numbers 12, and 1 Corinthians 13. And the reason for that is both of them discuss what prophecy is. And the prophets do not get a clear vision. Moses does. He gets direct vision. The Ten Commandments. Finger of God. The prophets see dreams and visions and they are filled with enigma. And everybody, I, I've been criticized so much for saying that. Well, that's what that text says. In Numbers 12, and that's what Paul says about his own writing. Yeah. Paul says, I see through a mirror darkly. Yeah. And if you, if you read the prophets, that really helps you. you these are visions, yeah. dreams, and they're not photographs. Right. So they can be very fuzzy. And right. 21 is the best it's, example. It's fuzzy. Of that. And you're right, it's fuzzy. But, Doc, you would agree that the major theme. It's to trust Yahweh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's and, it. And there are a lot of the prophecies that are very clear. But, but, but Doc is right. This is not as clear. And by the way, let me say this. Ruthann, I could be fuzzy too. Meaning, uh -huh. what I'm saying might not be full of clarity. Uh, because a lot of people smarter than I 
read this and say, Isaiah is looking ahead to 200 years down the road in 539 B.C. when Babylon is conquered by the Persians. But I look at this and I say in context, as he's writing, the Jews are scared of the Assyrians and they're wanting to trust the Babylonians and the Egyptians and the Idumeans, all these people that we're reading about, the nations that surround them. Help us, they say. And Isaiah said, no, don't trust them. They're going to be conquered. Trust Yahweh. That to, to me, it makes perfect sense. But I'm looking at the big picture. Now, let's drill down into the verses. Okay? And let's begin. Any other comments before we start reading? I just have a comment okay. that in the light of it all, Israel is a small little area, and they want to be dependent on somebody that can help them, and all around them can't do it. Only God. Amen. And by the way, uh, what you just said, Sue, that's what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans. Why did God choose Israel? Were they more numerous? Were they more powerful? No, they're a small nation among the nations. But in our weakness, he is made strong. Any good comment? Any other comment or question? This is your time. And the reason he chose Israel is not that they're better than anybody else. Absolutely. It's for them to be a light to the nation. Amen. And he owns all the nations and loves right. all the nations. But Israel's going to show him to them. They're going to be a light. But Doc, did they succeed in being a light? No. They didn't. So what happens is, because they weren't a light, judgment comes to Israel. So who then becomes the light of the world? The embodiment of Yahweh, who is the true Israel, Yeshua. That's how we are to live. Man, if we lived like Yeshua, it'd be a great world, wouldn't it? All right, let's go. Verse 21, verse 1, chapter 21, verse 1. The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. Now, this little phrase, wilderness of the sea, it's a, I want Doc's opinion on this, but I want you to think about this. In the book of Revelation, the sea represents the world. You'll see this. That's, that's in apocalyptic literature. The sea, the nation, the world, wilderness, <laughs> desert, uh, if you will, barrenness, the wilderness of the nations, Babylon. This is a synonym for Babylon, mystery Babylon. Basically, in the cycle of history, the wilderness of the seas is any nation that has its back toward God and trust in its might. Okay, let's go on. As windstorms, go ahead. It doesn't have the definite article with utterance oh, or oracle. Good. It's an oracle. An oracle. There may have been many others. I think Isaiah had many. To me, that this chapter is like the, the uh, a whole bunch of just through the one chapter. Yep. Yeah, an oracle, good in Hebrew, an oracle, not the definite article B. As windstorms in the Negev, that's the Arabian desert, sweep on, it comes from the wilderness, from a terrifying land. Um, basically, desert storm. If you ever watched Mission Impossible 3, it's my favorite <laughs> Mission Impossible. Uh, the Desert storms blow in from the east. And so in Jerusalem, when these storms come in, it's from the from Babylon, from the east. Okay, just like these windstorms sweep in. Verse 2. So this harsh vision swept in on me. You see the picture here is like I see this vision, this oracle. Which Yahweh has shown me. The, oh, wait. Go ahead. I'll, I'll mess, mess it all up. But it's not from the east. It's from the south. Ah. The negative is south. Agreed. In fact, let's pull up a map here. You're not going to mess it up, Doc. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's pull it up here. 
see if we have a map. Yeah. And and as you know, Doc, here's here's the Negev, and he's correct, from the south. But the Arabian Desert is here. Yeah. Okay. So you've got <laughs> desert to the south to the east. Doc's not messing anything up because if you have a south wind, which by the way, you know, we have a lot. Okay. <laughs> then it, get, it can get smoking cloudy. So Doc is correct. This is the Negev Desert from the south. This is the Arabian Desert, which will come. Here's Duma, which we will come to, which comes from the east. Most windstorms, uh, well, we'll see, east or south. Here's what's interesting. I tell people this all the time. What temperature is it in Jerusalem? The answer is whatever the temperature is here. Because Enid, Oklahoma is on the same parallel as Jerusalem. Yeah. Right. So if you're wearing a coat here, you need to be wearing a coat there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Doc. Let's go on. A harsh vision came on me, whether from the south or the east. A windstorm, the treacherous one still dealing treacherously. The destroyer still destroys. That's Babylon. The treacherous one, Babylon. The wilderness and the sea is still treacherous. The destroyer is still destroying. Now we come to the phrase that causes people to say, this is a vision of 539 B.C. Go up Elam. This is the Elamites. Go up Medes and lay siege on Babylon. Okay, 539, this is what Babylon looked like. And the Medes and the Persians, the Elamites, in fact, it doesn't, the Persians are not mentioned here. Doc points this out. Is Babylon mentioned? Uh, no, just only in the wilderness of the sea. So Doc is saying it might not even mean Babylon. Some Jewish commentators say this is a vision of Jerusalem being destroyed. I personally believe it is a picture of the Elamites and the Medes. They're, they're called out. Go up and destroy the destroyer. Go up and deal treacherously with the treacherous. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear. Here they are. Here's Babylon, Assyria, Asher, Nineveh, up here. So basically, it's Yahweh saying, Babylonians, you're going to meet your match in these. By the way, here's the Persians. The Persians are not even mentioned. The Persians don't come on the scene for 200 years. This is why I don't think it's talking about 539 and the Persian army under Cyrus conquering Babylon. It's just talking about these people right here. After 710, Babylon's destroyed. The Babylonians are scattered. Go up, Medes. Go up, Elamites. Deal treacherously with the treacherous. Aren't Go ahead. Medes and aren't they like small tribes at this time? They're not even, they're just warring yeah, tribes. Nancy, like. Nancy got it. She said it. They're just small warring tribes. They're not even part of the Persian Empire yet. They're just small warring tribes. So there's a clear vision to deal treacherously with the treacherous ones. And remember, the Jews are wanting to trust the Babylonians. This is the vision. Great, thank you, Nancy. And who are the Babylonians at this time? Are they they're a another tribe? Nation? They're, they're, not, they're not a nation. They're a tribe. Nancy asked the question, who are they? They're the Chaldeans. They're the Chaldeans. So what you've got, Chaldean, Babylonian, it's the same thing. It's, uh, I'll give you an example. In the English language, we use Indian. Well, nowadays you don't. I mean, that's politically incorrect. Native American, Cherokee. Same thing. Babylonian speaks more of a larger group of people, but Chaldeans is their specific name. By the way, right here, Ur, somebody tell me, Ur of what? Chaldees. Chaldees. Who came from Ur of the Chaldees? Amen. Very good. So these are the Chaldeans, these are the Elamites, these are the Medes. And in the vision that sweeps on him from the south or the east, uh, like a windstorm, he's hearing Yahweh say to these two small tribes, take care of the treasures. Do you see how it makes sense? But you wouldn't know that if you just read and you don't have the context. 
Make sense? All right, let's go on. I have made an end of all the groaning she has caused. Basically, I'm bringing an end to the Babylonians. And this is in the 710 to 700 BC time period. He's dealing with the Babylonians. Now, eventually, they rise again. And for 70 years, they reign as an empire. The world's second empire under Nebuchadnezzar and his father, Nabopolassar. Okay? All right, let's go on. But that, that's uh, 180 years later. Verse 3. For this reason, my loins are full of anguish. Pains have seized me like the pains of a woman in labor. I am so bewildered, I cannot hear. So terrified, I cannot see. Now, you got to ask yourself the question. This is Isaiah speaking. Why is he in pain like a woman in labor? Why is he terrified? Think with me now. Think politics. Oh, no. There we go. <laughs> terrified? Feeling like a woman in labor? All of the Jews thought their hope to repel the Assyrians who destroyed Israel it was in the Babylonians and the Egyptians on the two flanks who would provide them protection. And now the Babylonians are gone. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to do a Targum, Doc. You know what a Targum is? A Targum is when you take what's in the Hebrew Scripture, update it with modern events in the English language. Here's a Targum. President Trump has lost. President Trump is no longer president. President Trump has been wrongly swept out of the Oval Office. Here's the deal. If your trust is in President Trump, you're going to feel like a woman in labor. <laughs> Does that make sense? Therefore, don't put your trust in anyone but Yahweh. Make sense? So I want to say, Isaiah does not <laughs> rejoice in what's going to happen Very good. to the Babylonians. His heart is broken. Yeah. And we don't see that often. No, you don't. But also in Daniel, the prophets care about the folks. Yeah. Very good, Doc. You know, when, uh, who was the terrorist, Osama bin Laden, when he was killed by the raid of American soldiers yeah. in Delta? And it was national news. Okay, I wrote a post saying, do not cheer for the death of Osama bin Laden. Oh, my word, you would have thought I was a terrorist. And a traitor. But my point was this. Nowhere in scripture do you see the prophets reveling in the death of the wicked. They take no pleasure in it. Make sense? But in the book of Revelation, I see some of that reveling. Chapter 19, it's break my heart to read that. I thought I had PTSD yes. after working on that chapter. Yeah. Um, visions in the night, you know, and oh. And then the beautiful chapters. That 20 and 21. 20 and 21. But Doc, I, I think we'll deal with that when we get to Revelation. I think you would say, and thank you for grappling through that. In the end, God deals with wickedness. It is mine to avenge, says the Lord. I will repay. You don't do it. And even when he repays, he takes no pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. All right, let's go on. Verse uh, four. My mind reels. Horror overwhelms me. Why? Because of his vision. The twilight I long for has been turned for me into trembling. They set the table. They spread out the cloth. They eat. They drink. Rise up, captains. Oil the shields. Uh, you know, in his mind, the Babylonians are mighty. Okay, they've, they've got everything. But now verse six. For thus says Adonai to me, Go station the lookout. Let him report what he sees. And when he sees riders, horsemen in pairs, a train of donkeys, a train of camels, let him pay close attention, very close attention. We'll come back to it and I'll explain in a moment. Then the lookout in my vision called and said, O Lord, I stand continually by day on the watchtower and I am stationed every night at my guard post. Now behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs, and one said, Fallen, 
fallen is Babylon. And all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. O oh, my threshed people and my afflicted of the threshing floor, what I have heard from Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, I make known to you. Here's what Isaiah's vision, it's a, it's a little letter. By the way, at the end of verse 10, that's the letter. The question that was asked, how long does it take to write this? That's one letter, one <laughs> scroll. It ends right there. The next one is another one. The editor puts them together, and Doc points out at the beginning of verse 1, verse 11, and verse uh, 13, you have the same word that begins each vision or oracle in the Hebrew. Okay, here's what Isaiah is saying. All right, my people, you're trusting in the Babylonians just like in the previous letter I wrote you? You're trusting in the Egyptians? Go post the watchman on the wall. Babylon's going to be destroyed. And coming from the east will be horsemen in pairs. Look for them. Who are these horsemen? They're the ones fleeing Babylon. They're wiped out. Some of them went east and the Elamites and the Medes wiped them out. And then others come to Jerusalem. Watchmen, go look for them. And the watchman sees them in his vision. And they shout, fallen, oh fallen, Babylon has fallen. That's why I think it's 710. Because the Jews are wanting their help. Because Assyria is beginning to march on Jerusalem. An, an incredible story of how Yahweh delivers Jerusalem from the Assyrians in 701 BC. But what you have here is this vision of, don't trust in the Babylonians. Because they're fallen. And sure enough, it comes to pass. And that last verse, Isaiah says, look, it takes me no pleasure to tell you this at all. My heart's in agony. But I'm giving you the message that comes. I love this. I love the name of the Lord here. Yahweh of hosts. In English, that's not the word. Doc, what's the word in Hebrew? Army. Yahweh Zebaoth. of armies. Zebaoth. Zebaoth. Yahweh of armies, meaning Babylon has fallen, but Yahweh of armies is the one you should trust. All right, let's go on. Now you've got. Go ahead. In the Hebrew, I think it says, that's fine. Yeah. This army has a donkey pulling the chariot. Oh, very good. And camel pulling chariot. Very good. You wonder what in the world is that about? And the donkeys scare horses. The Persians used the horses coming in about, and if, when you had donkeys, they, the horses would get scared. Yeah. Isn't that funny? It is funny. Yeah. I mean, I think it's precise. Yeah. yeah. And why horsemen in pairs? Is there yeah. something significant about that? Doc, thoughts? Well, I think it's a, a big, I think it refer to a big army coming in, in rows, but. Yeah. Yeah. It, okay. So let me ask you this, Doc. Um, okay, Doc's saying he thinks it's a big army coming in, 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 in ropes. Very well could be. Very well could be. Just like some commentators think that this chapter is about the Persian army conquering Babylon in 539 B.C. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying this is the Babylonians. In, in, in 708, 707, in just two pairs. Because they're not coming in the form of an not. army they're coming in. It's the stragglers. Yeah. It's the survivors. It's the remnant. It's right. the escapees. Yeah. Horsemen side by side. Babylonians. <laughs> the people were trusting. It's a little bit like the Lord takes down the Trump organization because too many people have worshipped him. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I'm stepping on toes here. Here we go. Verse 11. The oracle concerning Edom. Now we switch. Now we switch. And maybe I'll, I'll pull up a map here and show you this. Another word for Edom is Idumea. Uh, now we switch. But here's what you got to understand. 
Chapter 20 is about the Egyptians. Chapter 21 begins with the Babylonians. The Edomites are right here to the south near the Negev along with the Midianites. The Edomites historically have come at different times to the defense of Jerusalem. And so what you have in this chapter, uh, and then we're going to go next in the last oracle in the five minutes we have left, to the Arabian Desert. Here is Duma. Basically, here's what's happening. Assyria is marching on Jerusalem. They've already destroyed the northern kingdom. Now they're going to take Judah. The Jews want to trust Egypt, Edom, Idumea, Duma, the Arabian Desert, and Babylon. The southern and eastern and western flanks of a central empire. And Yahweh of armies is saying, done, 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 done. They're gone. Who's left but me? And the last phrase of that, verse 10, yeah. is beautiful to me. It says, My threshed one and son, child of my threshing floor. Ooh, good. So, what is that about? Threshing is not to destroy. Yeah, very good. But it's to bring Purify. forth fruit. Yeah. And it's tough to go through it. Yeah. But that's his child. That's Yahweh speaking. Wonderful word, God. Yeah. Child of my threshing floor. Basically, Yahweh is saying, Oh, child, I have put you through the process of threshing. I am purifying you so that you trust in me. Trust in Yahweh with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. All right, let's finish up because we're going to finish this. Verse 11, the oracle concerning Edom. I showed you where Edom was to the south. One keeps calling to me from Seir. Seir is a mountain. A, a mountain directly south of Jerusalem. Watchman, how far gone is the night? Watchman, how far gone is the night? And the watchman says, morning comes, but also night. If you would inquire, inquire, come back again. Basically, um, it's this communication between the south, Edom, Idumea, and the watchman at Judah. What's happening? Are you protected? Are the Assyrians conquering? And basically, look, it, it may seem like morning, but night is still here. Keep, keep asking, keep inquiring. Basically, all this oracle is, is a vision of doubt. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what's coming. Just like in this room, we don't know about the economy. We don't know about the armies of China and Russia. We don't know about the future. We don't know. There's doubt. But we know the one who does know. All right, verse 13. Now we come to the third and final vision or oracle. The oracle about Arabia. Here's Arabia, right here. Adumea, down here in the Negev, southern desert. Arabia, this is the Arabian desert, right here. Duma uh, is the only really populous city uh, in this desert area. Mecca is down here. Mecca, uh, Medin, all of the Muslim capitals are near water further south. But here, the desert, Duma, people, the, the tribes, the Arabs, the archers from the desert, they'll protect us. Here's the oracle about Arabia. In the thickets of Arabia, you must spend the night, O oh, caravans of Dedanites, Bring water for the thirsty, O oh, inhabitants of the land of Tima. Meet the fugitive with bread, for they have fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the press of battle. Basically, here what you have is even the Arabians have been defeated by the Assyrians. Now, you've looked to them for strength. They need you to give them bread and water. Verse 16, for thus says Adonai, uh, for thus the Lord said to me, in a year as a hired man would count it, all the splendor of Kedar will terminate, and the remainder of the number of Bovin, the mighty men of the sons of Kedar will be few, 
for the Lord God of Israel has spoken. Now, let me show you this. Very, very few people understand that last section. And we'll end with this, and any questions you have will be done. The men of Kedar, the archers, have nobody knows where they come from. It's an enigma, as Doc said. But there's one guy that I read that does know, in my opinion. His name is Emmanuel Vilikovsky. Uh, he's a Hebrew. He's not a Christian. He's brilliant. He was Albert Einstein's best friend. And he is remarkable. I, every time I uh, last several months, Nancy, when I go to sleep, I'm reading Vilikovsky. Kedar says that Kedar, these are the great men of Cyprus who come to the land and they were known for their archery. In fact, you will read that uh, when Israel was existing as a kingdom to the north, uh, the wicked uh, king Ahab and his queen Jezebel, they had a daughter, uh, Atiyah, who ended up marrying the king of Judah of the south. Her bodyguards were Kedar. You read that in the Kings. These are archers that were, the best way I can describe them is, they were hired guns like the Wagner Corporation of Russia today. And they were all over protecting rebels against the empire. That last vision says the archers are wiped out. So now watch. You've got everybody you're trusting to protect you from Assyria, including the hired guns from Cyprus. And they're all gone. So, where do you turn? You turn to the Lord. Do you see how when you study a chapter like this, uh, and you get the context, it becomes really the foundation for your Christian life today? Everything we've just learned has its application today. We've got two minutes before we sign off. Any last comments, questions, thoughts? Does it make sense? Ladies, does it make sense? No. My good liberal heart says these folks are escaping in the desert. Go feed them. I agree. And give them water. Amen. And boy, that is tough in the Arabian desert. Yeah, good dog. Those, those are embarrassing verbs. Good for Doc. I always appreciate his classical liberal heart. <laughs> classical. I, I, I use that term. Go to the people who've been wiped out and defeated, no food, no water, and you, in the appendix, you give them bread, you give them water. Good. Does it have licensing or freedom not to live there? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, freedom. No, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free from freedom. Yeah, it's not, yeah. So, frankly, in my mind, the complacent are full of fear. But when you know the truth, you're free from fear. And we just read, I'll have to say, Doc, you can disagree, final word. We just read probably <laughs> one of the most difficult chapters in the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And if you can get truth from that chapter and become free from fear, man, it's, it's a downhill slide from here on. Thank you guys for watching online. Next week, Isaiah chapter 22. Uh, we will be meeting next week uh, and the following week, and we'll let you know uh, when we go to Israel, we'll take a, a two-week break, but we'll make that very clear before we go. So we are meeting next week, uh, and hope you can read ahead of time. We're coming to more chapters to the end of this Oracle of the Nations, and then we get into <laughs> some extraordinary chapters from Isaiah. God bless you. Have a great week. weekend. We'll see you next week.